Zoe, oh, thank you for the kiss, sweetheart. This is Zoe, and this is her roadmap to success. I had a lot of fun with you today, and you cannot eat the treats through my shirt. Um, so basically, um, she has, uh, basically, I'm going to start out kind of the beginning. This is a little bit of a longer session, but um, uh, she was a little under exercise. She got to walk just about every day, but it was at the end of the day, and it was one block walk. As you can tell, she's a little bit, she's got a little bit of a jelly with her uh, jam or a roll or whatever that expression is. So I mentioned that's one of the first things I mentioned the Guardian is she needs to lose a little bit of weight. She's middle-aged and so uh, a lot of us associate food with love, but it's really not and it's harder on their joints and it's gonna lead to arthritis and a lot of other problems. So one of the suggestions I always make when my clients have a, a dog that's a little bit heavy is uh, make sure that on structured feeding, which she was, um, look at the food that she's feeding and I think we could probably feed her a little bit different food and then we're going to talk to the green spot about that. But also what I do is I take a, a couple of fresh green beans, chop them up into little bits so they're about like, if I can get them out, about that size and then I sprinkle them in the food and I remove about 10 to 15 percent of the actual food that I'm feeding the dog. Read the bag, look at the dog's weight. Now she's probably probably weighs about two or three pounds more than what she actually should. So that would be her target range. And we would feed her a little bit less. Um, also, if we have the ability to do that, feeding a dog more often can help. Like I'm losing weight myself and I try to eat every three hours. So that keeps the metabolism going. But um, for her, I think she needs more exercise. And so, uh, and I like to see the exercise earlier in the day. Now, one of the problems she has is she doesn't like to drop the item. So one of the things I went over with the uh, guardians was how to teach your dog to drop. So when the dog has an object in its mouth, not when they're holding it with their paws, but it's got it exclusively in the mouth, we take a treat, touch the dog's nose, they'll try to take it with the object in their mouth, and as soon as they drop it, don't go for the item. That's why most dogs won't give the item up, because you forcibly take it away, or as soon as they drop it, you snatch it. So as soon as she drops the item, pop it in her mouth, they drop, and then she gets to pick her item back up. So now this is a deal. So if I just drop it temporarily, you give me something amazing, and I get my stuff back, sure. And after we practice enough with what we call low value items, toys that she's allowed to have at any point, then we can actually do it with a higher value item if she does steal a shoe or underwear or something she's not allowed to have. Um, and we, but like I said, this is something, that, well, I didn't say on this video, but I've said throughout the session, I like to break activities down in individual steps and help the dog practice each individual step in the easiest capacity possible. So the same sort of thing there, we're teaching her to drop with a low value item that she's allowed to have at any point, and then we work our way back up to other things. Now, once we get to the point where she'll drop low value items, then we could try to get her to fetch. Fetch is a wonderful way to burn off excess energy, much better than a walk. And so um, when I throw the ball, I say fetch. When the dog picks it up with its mouth, I say fetch. Then I hold a treat out, and when they bring it over to me, I don't tell it what to do, I wait. As soon as the dog drops, I pop the treat in their mouth, and I say the word fetch. I have one of your hairs on my tongue. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I pick up the ball. If we snatch it, we're saying that I don't think, I'm not confident enough of getting it, I have to snatch it from you. If I just go and get it, like casually, then it's, I'm confident I know it's mine. Then I usually make the dog sit or and sit and wait for some dogs, and then I throw it again. So fetch as I throw it, fetch when she picks it up, and then drop it, uh, put it in her mouth after she drops it and say the word fetch. Uh, but first teach her to drop and do this when she wants to fetch. A lot of us like to play fetch when we want to do it and the dog's not feeling it. And then we get frustrated, the dog's like, I don't want to do that activity again. They were all pissed off. So when she brings you the ball and she's in the mood, if you can, stop what you're doing and fetch her a little bit. Even if it's in the house, it's not convenient. But we want to build up that skill set because that would be really beneficial for her. We could also try the laser for her. For some dogs, the laser is not healthy. But uh, for her, um, she seemed to be interested in it, but as soon as the treats were available, she wasn't that interested. The treats that I brought are the chicken liver treats, and they should use these exclusively for the high value stuff, like the counter conditioning, uh, the leash exercise that we show in the videos above. Um, and then we would have like another meat treat that doesn't have quite as strong a smell and a cookie treat. So we're doing fetch, we might be able to, the cookie treat might be a strong enough reward to motivate her, but not so strong that she doesn't want to exclude the activity exclusively to get the uh, reward. Um, now I'd also recommend the guardian start an exercise journal. Write down the date at the top, write down the time and how many blocks we went on for a walk or how many fetches or how many, if she chased the laser, how many revolutions around the hat, whatever it was. And then uh, if she has an outburst, or if she chews something, she doesn't chew, but she has a problem behavior, uh, behavior problem, write down the time, a little bit of detail about it, and then at the end of the day, both guardians should give, uh, should assign a great letter grade from A to F for her be overall behavior through the day. And the guardians might wanna do that separately because one guardian might say that was an A and the other one's like that was a D. 
But eventually you'll get to the point where the next day you play around with the values, not eventually, but the next day play around with the values, maybe fetch a couple more times, walk an extra block or whatever it is. And then you're gonna eventually get to the point where they're like, that was an A plus day. Well, now we know the cocktail of what we need to do exercise-wise. Yes, I know. Um, <laughs> in order to uh, get her uh, to feel good and calm and relaxed. Now, when I went over uh, a trick to keep, give her a soft mouth. She is not super hard with me, but she's not a gentle treat taker. So practice that. I'd like the guardians to practice that for about a week or two. A about each guardian, maybe uh, about five treats each time we do this. Each guardian about twice a day. And within a week or two, we should see it uh, pretty much the point where you put the treat to her mouth. She like turns her head to the side or very gently takes it. Remember, you pull it away, say no. When she takes it gently, we say the word gently. Um, okay, now um, also for exercise for her, um, uh, there was something else I wanted to go over for exercise. Uh, okay. So this is, she doesn't, she's protesting about the cat right now. And I think for her, she's a herding breed, um, and so it's in her nature to want to control things, but she didn't really have any rules or structure, and she was able to tell her guardians to pet her, and if they didn't, she would do this whimpering that she's doing now and then get her way. And so I think they created a little bit of a petulant dog. Now, she had a bad back history. She was rescued out of a bad situation. And a lot of times that, that kind of carries over for us, and we keep on babying the dog when really it's important to do that at first to let the dog know you're in a safe place. But after a while, it can create a problem with the behavior and perception of reality. I think in her mind, I think she thinks she's in charge of the humans. And so, I mean, she, she uh, being a herding dog, if the, if the humans actually try to touch or embrace, and they're expecting a child, she freaks out. She tries to get in between them on the bed, all sorts of things where she's uh, not, uh, she's not, uh, she's not a Cupid, let's put it that way. So um, we went over a counter conditioning exercise and the guardians were able to embrace and kiss and touch the belly and all the things that normally she reacts to and she didn't make a peep. So practice that technique that I showed you off camera and question me, uh, message me if you have questions about it. Uh, I can share the videos. Anybody at home if I have that problem, you have to hire me and I get, I'll come out and I'll shoot a video for you. Um, but we'll need an extra person to do that wh where we can deliver that treat. Remember, we're gonna start as far away as we can where the dog stays seated and we'll be interested in the treat. And, if, and, then, and then at that point, we we'll practice a couple times until the dog's really relaxed at that distance. And then I would probably do a warm up and then practice. So let the person chew on the treat while they're, while, and make sure she's looking at you when you're embracing or hugging or whatever. And so we'll do it for about four or five treats with, the, with her nibbling the treat. And then the last time, the sixth time, have them do it without the treat. So we just warmed up, practice, 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 practice. Now we're gonna do it without a treat. So before we move to, if we're at seven feet, before if we move to six feet, we'd be able to practice five times and then do it cold, or and then do it and have her not react. And then try, and then maybe uh, have the couple walk away, come back, sit down, and, and do the embrace again. And then, um, there we go. Uh, and then try to do it again cold. If we can get to do it cold, like maybe once or twice after the walk away, and we can embrace and she doesn't charge, then at that point we'd go to six feet and then practice the whole setup at six feet until we can get to... She does the same thing, then we go to five feet, four feet, three feet, and eventually she's right next door. Now, because she likes to get in between her guardians, like in the bed and things like that, we talked about some rules, and one of the rules was not being allowed in the furniture. Now, because she's so grandiose right now, she can't get up on, and they have little steps for her, um, I would take away the steps um, just uh, and until we take off that weight, um, and then at that point, if she can get up on her own, then we would maybe correct her from getting up. Um, I need this to keep your attention, so we're not going to give you all of it right now. I just wanted to get you not barking at the cat because that's not very good footage. Um, okay, so um, we also went over other rules. Some of, the, some of the rules are, like I said, the furniture rule isn't big, not an issue for her because she can't get up on her own, but the guardians have been picking her up, so we're going to stop doing that. I showed the guardians how to teach her to go to her dog bed, um, and she was loving that. We call it Portland. Remember, come up with funny command words for anything. One word commands whenever possible. Make sure it's a unique word, and make sure it's, it has some resonance with you and your family and your friends. So when your you know, dog comes over and you say Portland, they're like, oh, you always go to Portland. Yeah, that's where we got the name from. So again, your friends will laugh and have, have a good time about it, and dogs will actually recognize a human facial expression or levity. Levity can actually help the dog uh, feel a little bit more comfortable. And it's nice for us. We want to have a friendly, happy dog. Um, other rules that we incorporated, we're sitting in the dining room right now. We're not going to shoot it, but there's a table, an area rug around the table. Well, when the humans are eating, the dog should not be on the area rug. Right now, she's underneath the table. 
it's inappropriate for a dog to be within seven feet of anyone who has a high value resource. Now again, for this, we can help her practice it in a similar fashion that we did for the, uh, the videos above, before and after about leashing the dog up. So we might actually get a piece of roast beef and sit at the table and cut it up and mar use the third escalating consequent, march at her. Now you wanna get down? I'll let you get down, there we go. Uh, until uh, she sits or lays down outside of the carpet. Then we put the lunch meat away and then we serve the actual meal. So this might be, again, something the gardens might need to practice for a week or two. And she might need to go out, by the way. She, this has been three hours since she has gone out. Uh, uh, so basically we help her practice it first and we, in the easiest capacity possible. And then gradually we add more and more layers and we don't do as much practice and we start working our way back to the real world situation. So eventually she'll just know that I can't come on the carpet when people are eating food. The rest of the time I can come and go, but just not in that capacity. Another rule is the dog should not be in the kitchen where we're preparing food. And the guardians should do the same thing. Uh, microwave a piece of, of uh, bacon and then simulate like you're cooking and use that third consequence. March directly at her until she lays down or sits. And remember, when you walk away, if you march towards her and she stops, don't turn or walk back because you're, giving, you're pointing your authority away from her. Take one step backwards and pause. Left, right, pause. Left, right, or right, left. And then just pause in between each step as you move away. And anytime the dog starts coming forward, we hiss and rush towards the doorway and stop as soon as she gets in the area that she's supposed to be in. Um, another rule is she has, she'd have to sit before we let her in or out the door. Remember, we're gonna keep on doubling the length of time. We ask once and give her three seconds. Don't repeat command words. The more you repeat a command, you'll train your dog to ignore a command word. And I see that all the time. So tell her to sit. One, two, three, she doesn't sit. I walk away and sit down and watch TV for one, and give, ask Siri to give you like a one minute timer. And then after one minute, go back and try it again. Then if she doesn't do it within three seconds, I walk away for two minutes, then for four minutes, then for eight minutes. Keep doubling the length of time. Um, let me see, I went over the four escalating consequences of disagree with unwanted actions uh, and, or breaking the rules. Remember to use the hiss before she breaks the rule. Um, so if she doesn't, then we're gonna stand up and turn to face her, go through all those rules, all that uh, for the second consequence. And if you need to do it a third time, then we march at her and the fourth time is the leash time out. Message me for get the details on those and I can refresh your memory. Uh, let me see, now anybody, uh, we talked a lot about in Omaha, unfortunately most of the dog trainers in Omaha use the old way of training which is force and punishment based. We don't use that here at Dog on Problems because it's, it's not the modern uh, current method. It creates a lot of stress, anxiety, uh, breaks the dog's spirit and a, and a lot of other unintended consequences. And I've talked to all these local trainers and they just keep on saying, but it works. Well, I can slap a child and get the child to stop crying. That works, but I'm trading one problem that's small now for a much bigger problem later on. And people do this with dog problems all the time. This is why a lot of people hire other trainers end up having to call me to fix the problem the trainer caused and then fix the problem. Trainers are great, but that's for training. Behavior is different. So um, uh, I don't know why I went off in that tangent, but basically we don't want to punish the dog for doing the wrong things. We're just going to create stage scenarios where we can help the dog perform the way we want. Anytime it doesn't, Instead of punishing or correcting, we just turn off our interest. We walk away. We sit down and we wait for the dog to return to a completely calm state of mind before we practice it again. But again, the practice should be, again, one element only. So if you have other activities that the dog doesn't behave in well, ask yourself, first of all, have I taught the dog to be, how to behave? If we have it, then how can I break it down and simulate the real world situation, but practice one step over and over until the dog knows how to perform that step? Only then do I move to the next step. Once I have all the steps together, or done separately, then I string them all together. But again, in the easiest capacity possible. Once I can do them all together, then I gradually start adding in the other elements until we get back to a real world situation and the dog can handle it with a plum. Uh, now, oh, that's where I went on my tangent, is I want to talk about positive dog training, because uh, unlike most of the trainers in town, we exclusively use positive reinforcement. So I went over ways that the guardians can do that. The guardians have been inadvertently petting the dog at times where they really were rewarding unwanted actions and behaviors. Anything your dog is doing when you pet it is what you're reinforcing, and this includes unbalanced states of mind, and these guardians, like just about every other guardian I've ever worked with, interpret excited for happy. But excited is an unbalanced state of mind, and unbalanced states of mind is when we're gonna make mistakes. So what I recommend the guardians do is if uh, the dog is excited when they come home, ignore the dog, walk through. Don't let the dog jump up on you. You might shrug your, sh uh, your shins a little bit for that. If she jumps up a lot, let me know. I can show you a technique for that as well. Uh, but the idea is we wait, and she's like, but they're not paying attention to me anymore. And then once she settles, then reach, then turn towards her. And as soon as you turn towards her, she recognizes, she's gonna start wiggling and get all excited. Pull your arm back, don't say no. We don't correct. 
We just put the dog in stage situations. When the dog does what we want, we reward them. When they start doing what we don't want, we lose interest in them. And this is the fourth quadrant of operant conditioning, which is basically deducting something from the equation the dog wants, your attention. So as soon as I'm calm, they're all over me. As soon as I'm excited, they stop paying attention to me. A lot of people do this with fearful dogs. The dog is fearful, they pet it to try to soothe it. It works great for human babies, but for dogs, that's gonna make the dog more fearful or more uh, stressed or anxious or whatever it is. So now if a dog is stressed, I can touch the dog and let the dog know I'm here with you and I love you. Dogs do associate touch with love, but don't pet because that will be amplifying it. Now also, if the dog is doing something we like, we'd like to pet under the chin. Um, when a dog feels good about itself, his nose is parallel to the ground or tilted up. You've probably seen your dog walking around your house with your shoe. They got their nose up in the air, they feel good about themselves. Well, I went over passive training and petting with a purpose with the guardians, so we can use petting and giving the dog attention to motivate the dog to want to do positive actions. So if every time right here, she just came, come. This is passive training. So she's walked up to me on her own. I didn't ask her to, but it is a desired action, her coming to me. So I just pet her and say the word come. Remember, you have three seconds to pet or correct your dog for them to have the ability to make the connection. So if every time your dog comes to you on its own, you pet it and say come, well, come is a good thing. I'm happy to come. A lot of us only use our dog's command words when it's the end of fun. Dog's outside having a great time in the yard, yelling at the squirrel. We don't want to get yelled at by the neighbor, so we say come inside, the dog comes inside, and then we close the door. It's like, I was having a blast. I listened to you, and now the fun is over. You're a buzzkill. And that's what a lot of us do that with a lot of our dog's commands. So for passive training, it's just simply recognizing the dog every time it does it. And I usually say testify. So testify means if somebody says that to me, that means the dog just did something and I missed an opportunity to pet, but we're still in that three second window. So I look at the dog and whatever the dog do it, I just pet, it's sitting, I pet it and say sit. If it's standing, I assume it came and just pet it and say come. Um, if it lays down, crash or whatever your word is. And so by rewarding the dog for desired actions and behaviors, the dog will start to emulate them. Most of us train our dogs to ignore, uh, to do the wrong things because that's when we correct the dog. Well, for dogs, attention is validated, even bad attention. So if the dog chews the wrong thing and we chew it out, well, that's how we're training the dog to get our attention. Well, now we're training the dog to sit, come, lay down, and do all these other great things, come. Um, and also avoid patting on top of the head. We can caress, we can scratch, just never pat. Always try, and if all things are equal, pat under the chin. Say just the command word, don't say good sit. Saying good sit or good dog isn't, doesn't hurt you, but it does not help you. The dog already knows you're happy because you're giving it attention or you're petting it. But if you, it sits and you pet it and say sit exclusively, well, sit now is associated with the action of sitting and with getting a reward, and then I'm more inclined to want to do those things. Now, I also went over petting with a purpose, which is because she's just climbing on top of or jumping on her guardians or nudging them or whimpering and whining until she gets attention. Well, she's telling us what to do, which is part of the reason why she thinks she's in charge. Part of it's genetic. She's a herding breed. So from now on, when she nudges the humans and said the human's doing what she wants, they're going to give her a counter order. Tell her to sit. If she's already sitting, ask her to come and sit over here. If she's already sitting, ask her to lay down. She just has to do something to change her state before I pet her. And once she sits, I pet her under her chin and say the word sit. If I say sit and she doesn't sit and she's whimpering for attention, I just, after three seconds, I lean back and start watching TV, pull out my phone and play words with friends or do something else. And no matter how much she whimpers, I ignore her. Because if I look at her or I correct her, that's rewarding. That's validating. And after a minute, I might give her another opportunity to do it. But the more we pet with a purpose and pass the training, then the more that we ask her to sit, the more she's inclined to do it. Um, and these are the two easiest things that you can train any dog. And really, if you get in a habit of doing it, every time you pet your dog, it's like a micro-obedience training session before they, they do every time you pet your dog without even thinking about it. Um, let me see. Now, uh, we have a little one on the way in the family. And so I'm going to go through some tips that I didn't go over during the session to help the guardians uh, prepare for the baby. Now, if you go to my uh, website, doggoneproblems.com, at the top, if you click on dog training or dog behavior column, I have been writing a column, my four-year anniversary for the, writing it for the World Herald's coming up in, I think, a week or two. And I have done a couple articles on uh, ra uh, babies, uh, introducing the baby to the child. Now, uh, one of the rules, uh, and before I go into where I was going, if, if you have children, anytime the dog is on the bed or in the kennel, that should be a safe zone. The children are not allowed, to, not allowed to interact with the dog or entice the dog to leave. We want the dog to have safe places to go so that if I don't like what the kids are doing, I can go here and they leave me alone. If you don't set that up with kids, you will end up getting a kid nipped or bitten by the dog because the kids don't always listen. Even when we tell them what to do, kids don't always listen. Dogs will take care of that on their own, and we don't want the dog to think I have to take care of it. I want the dog to see the humans are interceding by creating a good rule structure, like if I'm on the bed, I'm safe. 
Now, uh, going back to the pregnancy thing, uh, when we uh, everything is sent to dogs, and we, when not we, but when women get pregnant, typically there's a baby shower, and then you get all these sorts of gifts, and a lot of them are related to raising the child. A lot of them are lotions. Now, a lot of women will rub like uh, coconut butter butter on their uh, on their belly to prevent getting stretch marks. That smells different. The dog's attracted to that. The woman's hormones are changing when the, she is carrying a child. Dogs can smell that. So everything starts changing. It puts the dog a little bit on edge, and especially this dog that thinks it's in charge. So when we have the baby shower, I'd like the mom to grab a lotion every day. Yeah, there's a lotion called butt paste I just learned. Grab butt paste, put a little butt paste here, a little bit here, and then walk around. So now the dog is smelling the butt paste and that, scent, that specific aroma without the presence of the child. By the time the child comes, that scent is old news. It's not exciting. It's not anything to get worked up about. I've smelled it on my human 20 times. Um, before I forget, because I'm probably going to, I meant to say this multiple times to the guardians. If you're having a kid for the first time, my sister gave me a great piece of advice. It's called, uh, like, uh, I think baby suitcase or baby briefcase is I think what it's called on Amazon. You'll get a lot of forms and stuff, and here I am giving parenting advice. I'm the last person to get parenting advice. This is from my sister, Tara. Um, but she said, you get so much stuff and you lose track of it. The baby briefcase actually has little dividers, and she's like, every time you have a kid, Afterwards, she goes, you can look through and see the, you know, sonogram and all this different stuff. I have sonogram, I guess, before the kid comes. But um, something you might want to look into. Um, all right, so uh, the other thing is we'd like to help the dog practice not going in the baby's den uh, or the nursery. Now, the nursery is not quite ready yet. We have some time before the baby comes, but our cameraman here is going to be hard at work fixing that room up. The dog should practice not going into that room. When mom is breastfeeding, that's an intimate act. Mom needs to have some space without the dog there and not without the door, not with the door closed. We want the dog to practice not going in that room. So once the room is set, I'd like mom to spend some time going into that room and practicing being in that room, reading magazines, watching a little something on the iPad. At first, just a minute or so. And we wait for the dog. And when we first do this, as soon as I like, if the dog tries to come in, we use the third S clean consequence and a hiss first and march at the dog. And it's going to try to come in, and I kind of went through this off camera, so the guardian should remember it, message me if you forget it. But eventually, and when we sit down, remember, when you sit down, expect the dog to break the boundary the first couple times. So when you sit, make sure your hips are pointed at the dog, and don't sit deeply into the chair. Sit like on the edge, because you probably are going to have to get up the first couple times. But eventually, the dog will stay outside the room. When it sits or lies down, I would get up and walk out of the room and give it a treat, and maybe say the word uh, boundary or border or... Uh, you know, some word that means you're not allowed to come in here. And so as, as soon as the dog sits or lays down, then I get up and get a treat and the human leaves the room. And then just like we did for the leash, we want to start elongating that once the dog starts doing it on its own. And then after it sits, we're going to wait two seconds before I do it, and then four seconds. And eventually you'd like to go in there and watch like a half an hour comedy on your iPad or something with the dog staying right outside the room. And also if you get the, the baby... Uh, bassinet or whatever it's called, you might pr pretend going over there. Get a crying baby, you know, those baby, uh, uh, plastic babies, and practice changing diapers. And so you're practicing turning your back and giving your back to the dog, but you're watching. Or maybe set up a mirror on the wall so you can see the dog as your pretend diaper. Again, we're practicing, helping the dog practice the behavior we want in the easiest capacity possible. There's not a real baby here. The real baby's still here. But now the dog has practiced this behavior, and when the baby comes, it's easy. Now, I also recommend the guardians uh, look into enrolling uh, her, uh, Zoe into, uh, uh, we like Dogtopia because we teach classes out there. It's a great doggy daycare. Um, getting her, uh, it'll help with her weight um, and also help getting her used to it because when the baby comes, we probably want like a one or two week period where we're taking the dog to daycare every day because dad's going to be diligent at the hospital. And mom, you know, one or three days, she's going to be staying there. And so we're going to spend, the dog's going to have not a lot of time here. Well, if it's a daycare, and we prep it by being, going to daycare this week or next week, months before the baby comes, and the dog just gets used to it. I like going to daycare. And then when the, the week before the baby comes, it's a stressful time for the family. Just having the dog gone can be helpful during the day, uh, not overnight, but each day when it comes home, it's gonna be nice and relaxed. And then especially the days the, uh, the day the baby comes home, we wanna basically have the baby, uh, the dog at daycare all day long, so when it comes home, it's just tired, and we can focus on the baby. Now, a couple other little tips. Um, dogs learn, this is, like I mentioned earlier, they need by scent. One of the things you can do is when your baby is done, uh, is born, uh, take a towel, like a little hand towel, they'll give you one at the hospital, wipe the baby down, not with the afterbirth, but just we wanna get the baby's scent on it. Then dad's gonna bring that home, we're gonna lay that uh, little towel on the floor, and if the dog goes and sniffs it, then we're gonna give the dog a treat. 
sniffs it again, give it a treat. Do that about five or six times and then pick it up and put it in a Ziploc bag and burp the air out of it so it's gonna retain the baby's smell. Do that about three to five times a day the first day and when the baby's born. So now we're introducing the dog to the baby's scent without the actual baby present, without mom present, in the easiest capacity possible. Notice the trend here? Um, now, um, after uh, the dog start, stops going over sniffing because it's comfortable with it, you could actually drop a treat on there. Now when I go lick the treat off, I'm getting some of the baby's scent again in the, uh, delivered that way. So uh, there's little tricks like that that you can do. Like I said, if you go to my dog behavior com, there's about nine or 10 other tips that, I've, that you can go through. Uh, they're not coming to my brain right now. It's been a long session. Um, but setting the dog up for success by properly exercising it, introducing it to the baby, as well as like, developing skills by not going to the baby room, uh, you know, developing self-control and all the rest of that stuff before the baby comes is gonna put us in a great position to succeed afterwards. Um, let me see, um, for, the, for the treat delivery, remember, uh, anytime the dog jumps for it, we're gonna pull back and say no. When it, we, it's nice and soft, we put the, dog, the treat in the dog's mouth and say the word gentle. Um, that was something the guardians were really impressed, impressed about because she's got kind of a hard mouth. Um, and then, um, trying to think, uh, that's pretty much all I can remember now. Now, if you have questions, make sure you call or text me. If I don't hear from you, I assume everything is going great. Well, I, I, I showed the guardians how to use the martingale collar uh, and add the special twist to the leash. If you have questions about where to do that or how to get the dog walk next to you, message me and again, I can share a video for you with that. Uh, but get the dog used to that for dogs whoever's in front is in charge. So we don't want the dog to get used to walking in front of us when we're not walking next to us. Um, so if you have any questions or problems moving forward, make sure you call or text me. If I don't hear from you, I assume everything's going great. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I think anything you can think of? All right. Well, this is uh, Zoe's around here somewhere and this is her roadmap to success. Remember, Everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.